for attending after we start recording. Thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. If I go into presenter mode on the slideshow, there we go. Wait, no, you guys can't see that, can you? Whoops. All right, wrong screen. Let me stop that for a second. Sorry, I run dual monitors and sometimes I don't get that right. So let's try that. All right, so can everybody see that one? Okay, awesome, awesome. So one of the one of the things I want to do right in the beginning is just introduce what my background is. <laughs> like Andrea said, I have been an automotive technician for many years, and art history is kind of like a new thing that I've decided that I wanted to review. So for my background, my prior career, I would say, was as an automotive technician. I am actually an ASC certified automotive master technician. That means I had to pass a series of eight tests to become master certified. I actually have two additional tests which I needed in order to teach. So I actually teach automotive at Mesa Community College. I also have been certified as a service advisor and as a part consultant. Uh, much like the medical field, we are required to recertify uh, about every four years to make sure that we are on top of everything that we are aware of new and current technology. I have worked as an automotive technician, a service advisor, and a parts consultant at GM, Chrysler, and Ford dealerships. I've worked at Honda Infinity, which is basically a high price Nissan, and Volkswagen. And then my last position was as an automotive subject matter expert at Mitsubishi, the actual corporation, not the dealership, but at the uh, manufacturer level. With all of that background, I have found that I enjoy teaching. So at every position, there's always a portion where you have to teach the new people coming in. It's either, you know, how you deal with this new system, or you didn't used to working around at a dealership, or, you know, just showing them the ropes. When I became a subject matter expert for Mitsubishi, I'm sorry, what did I say Mitsubishi? I meant Hyundai. I work for Hyundai. I've worked for so many dealerships, I sometimes get confused where I've been, because I've been to so many. So when I was working for Hyundai Motor America, I had to do a lot of training classes for some of the incoming agents. And I enjoyed that so much, I applied at Mesa Community College, and with my background and my certifications, they were excited to have me. And so I spent the last four years teaching automotive. So some of the images I have here, one of them there is my chair. He, we're doing an electrical car. So during the electrical lab that I was part of teaching, we're going over the components of how to properly repair and diagnose electric cars. And then down in the lower left-hand corner, um, one of the, and he's standing there with his hand on the engine, one of the students brought I believe it was a 68 Mustang he brought in. He was having issues with starting it. So we brought that in, just, you know, something new for us to take a look at. And then here's my brakes class as I'm trying to get him to finish up. And they're just having so much fun. They were actually um, students in my 101 class that I taught. And then they ended up here in brakes class that I was substituting for. That They're just all excited about getting things done. So this has been so much fun. Then I went over to ASU for my undergrad. So I actually have a bachelor's in fine art in, if it's an emphasis on drawing. And then I went on for, and I'm currently in my graduate degree for art history. My focus or my thesis is currently on women and the depiction of machinery from World War I through World War II. So I'm trying to incorporate both halves of my background into one, it, it's really weird. I feel kind of bipolar actually with it. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and take this lens that I have 20 plus years experience in and look at artwork from that perspective. It's gonna be slightly different than what you're used to from just an art historian background. This is gonna see how we actually view things because we try to pull things apart and figure out how they work whenever we look at something. 
So, okay, so we didn't like how I moved the next one. All right, let's try that one. I'll go to the next slide. There we go. So we're going to go ahead and what I call looking at impractical nuts and bolts. My concept is that artists take these fasteners. Anything that holds two pieces together is a fastener. So in the automotive industry, it's not unusual for a technician to have over $50,000 worth of tools in this toolbox to do one thing, remove fasteners. That's all they're there for is just to remove fasteners. We have short wrenches, we have long wrenches, we have combination wrenches, we have box wrenches, we have wrenches in circles, we have wrenches that make use, we have wrenches with three right angles on it. Then we have, Drivers, you have your flat tip screwdriver, you have your Phillips screwdriver, you have your Torx screwdriver, you have tamper tube um, Torx. So these are different types of drivers. And then this whole other thing opens up of what we call sockets. You have your deep sockets, you have your shallow sockets, you have your 30 quarter deep sockets, you have extremely shallow sockets. And then these sockets are 12 point, they're six point, and then each fastener on the vehicle has its own socket for the part. So you may have five different sockets just to work on the front suspension. You may have six different sockets just to remove an oxygen sensor off of a vehicle. These are all different types of fasteners and tools that technicians keep in their toolboxes just to remove fasteners. That's all it does, remove fasteners. And I'm not even going to get into the amount of tools that you need just to work on a brake system properly, depending upon what manufacturer you're in. Because I've worked at so many manufacturers, European, American, and Asian, I have so many different tools. Or actually, I had so many different tools. Since I'm not in the industry anymore, I don't keep all those tools to remove fasteners. It, it's just crazy the amount of money that we spend on just some fasteners. And then the other $50,000, so you have $50,000 in tools just to remove fasteners. Then you have another $50,000 in diagnostic tools. So these are things like gauges that tell you how much pressure are in different portions of the vehicle or you need another type of diagnostic tool where you plug into the computer. So if you think about it, as technicians, we spend a lot of money on tools to do one thing, remove a screw to remove a bolt. That's basically what we're doing. <laughs> I had an electrician come into a house one time and I looked at him and I'm like, you have a five gallon bucket and in it, you have everything you need to do this repair, no matter what it is in the house. And then in the couch that lines the outside of your bucket, you have a bunch of tools. And that's all the tools you need. He's like, yep, I can fix anything in anybody's house with this amount of tools. I said, do you ever need anything extra? He's like, no. I was so jealous of that guy at that point. I was like, I have this huge toolbox that is nearly taller than I am. I'm only by one in order to hold all of these tools to remove fasteners and you have a five gallon bucket to do a repair. All right, so that's a little background of what I'm gonna look at here in this presentation. I just kind of wanted you to see how, for me, I, I look at fasteners. Sometimes they're the bane of my existence, as in that we have to cut them off in order to remove them. And sometimes I'm just so excited. I'm like, yes, it's a Phillips head screwdriver, yay! So the first piece that we're going to look at is Steve Allen. And his piece is called Under Pressure. And this is something that, for me, it resonates right off the bat. Because when I was growing up, my father was also a technician. And he did everything. You know, He welded. He built his own cars. He was so meticulous about his car building that he would build his own engine stands to hold the engines he was building. He would weld them all together himself. So I grew up basically in the automotive industry. So what I would do, just to go have fun, because, you know, you're weird, I went out and my father was like, okay, I need you to sort all these fasteners. I've got, I need the bolts to go in this bucket and I need the screws to go in this bucket. So I learned right off the bat at a very early age, these different types of fasteners. And when I was done, of course, you know, you're like nine, 10 years old, you know, that idea of putting a square peg in a round hole, well, I use fasteners to do that. 
is that he would let me play with his brass fasteners, which was so great. And you can like build all kinds of things. It was kind of like the mechanics idea of Legos, that you could screw different brass fasteners together and you can make all these interesting shapes. And that's exactly what um, Steve Allen's piece reminded me of. So he uses fasteners though in a slightly different way than I would be able to like in the real world. So if we're looking at this piece, we see right front and center, this red nut. So at the inside that we can see, we see the threads, but the threads aren't connected to anything. So you're like, okay, that, that can happen because sometimes nuts are welded to a plate so that the nuts stay stationary, allow you to put a bolt through. And I can tell that those are machine threads that he was using as inspiration by how closely they are to each other. Same thing if we're looking at the screw over there to the left, it's turquoise with a yellow head. From that, I can see that this is also a type of a machine screw. And I know off the bat by looking at the way that head is rounded, that it's either something that uses a Phillips screwdriver or a flat tip screwdriver. Just by looking at this, I don't even have to see the head. Just from being in the industry, I know. And then I'm looking here at what we would call just bolts. So any fastener that has a hexagonal head, like we're looking at the one at the very bottom that's black with the gray threads, that's called a bolt. Or the one right next to it with red, that's called a bolt. So anything with a hexagonal head is a bolt. Then the fastener off to the side, which is like a slight green, that's probably a nut. So anything that's hexagonal is a nut and bolt. The other thing I found really interesting is if we're looking at this green shape in between the yellow head of the screw and the red nut, that it's got some lines in it and it's round. Well, that's called knurled with a K, knurled. So that allows you to actually move this fastener with your fingers. So that fastener just turns using your fingers and it's rigged like that to allow you to turn it so you have something of a grip. And I love the sign that says warning contents under pressure. I'm like, cool, but the way this is all set up, you don't even know how anything's under pressure because you have all these openings that are open. So I'm, I'm just kind of confused of how we got under pressure. Then at the very top, where these two cylinders meet, these white and purple cylinders meet, and it looks like this dark green ball, and then protruding out of it is another yellow cylinder. And then at the very top of that, we see the red threads and like this red square on that. Believe it or not, that's called a plug. A lot of times the plug, because it's square, we have to have a special fastener for that one. It goes over that, so it's another type of socket, and it unscrews it and allows you to remove the pressure. A lot of times you'll see that in the automotive field that will have that in the engine in where the, near the water pump that allow us to remove the air out of the engine for the water pump so that you don't have an overheating condition. So I was just looking at this. I'm like, hey, that's cool. That's something I use in the automotive field, but I don't see anywhere where you can actually keep pressure inside your system because of the way he has these all put together. And also, you don't drill into round things. It's nearly impossible to have something that's round stay stationary long enough to drill into it to put a plug into it. You, you don't see that. So that was another fascinating thing I saw when I was looking at the screw head that's white with that yellow slot in it, which is a flat tip, and then you see the machine threads in there. That's actually kind of unusual that if you have machine threads, it's usually a Phillips head where it looks like an equilateral cross versus just a slot for a slotted head. And that's because of the amount of torque that is needed for removing or installing a fastener. The reason that they have these machine threads is because of torque. So in other words, pressure. So the amount of force it takes you to push open a door, that's torque right there. That's what we consider torque. So the more threads that they have, say we're looking at the red nut in the middle and say we have six threads. Well, there's six threads on each of these bolts. 
where that surface area is, is what holds that fastener in place and keeps it from being pushed away. So that's what we would consider the torque, that force that's pushed on these threads to hold them in place. Now, when you're putting that kind of torque down on these threads, you need something that'll give you some torque. So anybody that's ever had to use a flat tip screwdriver on a, on a screw and try to screw that puppy in, you're like, this was not fun. This is why all fasteners on a vehicle are Phillips head or one of the other type of fasteners. We do not use slotted heads because they're incapable of handling the torque that you need to have on your vehicle. Now with that idea of torque in mind, we're gonna look at Mr. Yali Younger in his high pressure teapot number two. For me, this is another fascinating piece. Now, if we had actually had to build this in real life, so if you're thinking like boilers, like back east people use boilers, and so they heat this boiler up and then the steam rises and heats up everything. I'm in Northern California, we don't have boilers back here, and in Arizona, of course, it's always so hot, you know, you rarely turn on your heater. But the type of fasteners they use are these little dots that he has on this teapot are actually rivets. So rivets, if you think about the surface area when we were thinking about the nut and the screw going together, fastening together, well, these rivets have even more surface area in which to hold these plates together. So if you're building a boiler, the rivet is the best type of fastener because it can withstand the largest amount of torque. So when he built this teapot, he was keeping that in mind of those type of fasteners. And then he has little areas too that look like welds. Welds technically is a type of fastener because it's taking two materials and they're melting the metal together so that it is now fastened together. And it is the strongest type of fastener that you can make. So he's got those in there. And the other thing that I really enjoy, so where the spout of the teapot where you would pour, he has a bracket in there. Brackets are great supports, and this would be a support bracket. Unfortunately, because the support bracket in theory would be made out of metal and also add weight to the components, we usually use holes, circles, since the circle is the strongest type of shape, to remove material to make the bracket lighter without damaging its integrity. So we have this whole teapot He's all thinking all of these mechanical ideas and how fasteners work, which I just thought was captivating. And then he tops it off, literally, with a gauge. I was like, oh, wow, he has great designs for his teapot. So it's PSI, pounds per square inch, and it goes from zero to 100. I don't know about you, because I love my tea. I am not going to have my teapot sitting at 100 PSI for my hot water because one of the things we learn in the automotive field that your cooling system is actually under pressure. The idea of putting your cooling system under pressure raises the boiling point. That's why your vehicle can run at 210 degrees and that's normal. That's not an overheating condition is because we put it under pressure. So I can just imagine how hot this person likes his tea if he's putting his water under pressure to heat it up. And I was just like, oh my gosh, I like my tea hot, but man, I do like to drink it, you know, sometime during the century. So this was another fascinating um, type of work that I really enjoyed. It's taking a lot of the fun stuff and almost poking fun at the way that they make boilers because they're so dense and intense so that all this pressure doesn't explode, but putting it in a, like a little small container with a teapot. Now, as we are talking about gauges, the next teapot, that I saw was really fun, is Jason Walker's Grow Vase. And I was looking at this and I was like, wow, he's incorporated a lot of different fasteners in a very unusual way. So if we just start at the base, you know, we have this steel plate looking vase, which would be like a half inch thick, thick plate, which would be extremely heavy. And then he's got these silver hex heads, which would be the ends of bolts as stands. And I was like, that's really inventive. Um, normally we don't use the heads of bolts as stands. So I thought that was really inventive. And then he comes up and then he has like this gas line coming up. So that corrugated 
type of line, what you usually see is gas. And it's because it can bend and turn to any configuration that you need. So that's really not something that we see a lot in the automotive field because most of our components are molded to that particular vehicle. And it's usually aftermarket components where people don't know the size of what it's supposed to be, that they'll just put something in there. And you'll be amazed at some of the interesting things you see on vehicles. We have to explain, no, a garden hose cannot handle the pressure to keep your vehicle from overheating, hence the reason why now you have a second fluid. And then we have the fasteners between the two sides. So that's usually like a lead fastener that you see in plumbing. And then he has another fastener going in. And I think this is a great detail, the way he did this going into the vase itself. To keep your fasteners from leaking, so we're talking about how the threads contain torque. Well, there's still some space in there. So you take this Teflon tape, commonly known as plumber tape, around those threads. So when you put it in, it also keeps liquid from moving out. So not only does it keep the fastener from moving, it also keeps any liquid from moving past those two surfaces. Well, he also has like this little white stuff sticking out that just totally reminds me of like, oh, he, he did plumber's tape in his vase. That's so cool. And then of course we end with a handle. And I was like, cool, most of you have seen this, you know, you use it to turn on your sprinklers. And I'm like, but it goes into the end of a hose. The handle goes into a hose. And all it is is a stopper that moves up and down. So it's threaded as you turn it, it's threaded. And then it just has a little stopper at the bottom that moves up and down. But I'm like, it goes into a hose. How does that hold itself in place? There's no threads in a hose. But it was just like, oh, that's so cute. A new way to use handles for stop the stoppers. And then if we go over to the, the other side of the vase where I think, I wasn't quite sure what this is supposed to be. Is this just supposed to be a gauge to show what we're doing on the vase? I'm not quite sure. But what we're almost seeing it from the back. I wasn't able to see the front, but the way that it's all constructed that I could see, it looks like it's just a pressure gauge like we saw on the prior pot, the prior teapot that we still have that right angle pipe with the gas line coming out, and then we have a gauge. Now, for any type of pressure gauge to work, you would have to think that it would be able to, I don't know, keep pressure? And what's the worst thing for pressure? Not being able to have pressure. Same idea behind any type of hydraulic system. If you have a leak, then it's not working really well. It's really bad if that happens in your brake system. So if we have this pot under pressure, but there's nothing to screw that into because there's no screws in the hose, he just puts a gauge in it. But it's cool that we get to see the fasteners of the gauge. So those two little Phillips head screws are what we use to actually, um, you can adjust some of the gauges or they actually hold the face of the gauge in place. So I was like, cool, we have all these fasteners that are being used completely different. And so that was like really fun, not to mention the beautiful artwork of the Death Head Butterfly, but I was just really fascinated how he was reconfiguring how to use these different types of fasteners. Now, some people really love fasteners and they just like to collect them for some reason. There's, there's no technician that doesn't have a whole box dedicated to fasteners. And I have to admit, I am guilty. I still have fasteners. When I sold my hot rod, I gave the guy boxes of fasteners that went with the car. And I still have fasteners. It's something we just can't escape from. So the next piece that we'll look at is by Dennis Clyde. And it's antiseptic service. And he loves fasteners. He made them all little silver points all across his truck. I thought that was so great. So for an aseptic service, if we're actually looking at this tank and it was made to hold liquids, and of course, if they had, or if they're expelling any type of gas, it would have to be a pretty hefty type of container. Unfortunately, they don't use chrome fasteners on something like that. Chroming is a process where the metal is dipped in the chrome and then baked. So chroming isn't something that you're going to see on a septic service truck, but I thought it was really cool there. 
that he's got all these fasteners. And then on the hubs of the wheels, he's got it nice shiny. And then at the very bottom where the tires are, you can see all the little lug nuts are chrome. I was like, that's so cool. And then we have the gas tank where the cap is fastened on top of the gas tank, that's chrome. And then where the handle is, open the door, where it pivots, it's chrome. I know it was cool. And then the intake stacks of the engine that hold them, the, the filters in place. Well, all those are chrome. And then the exhaust stack, he's got that chrome. I thought that was so cute. He's just chroming everything that sounds good to be chrome. But once again, he's just chroming all of these fasteners. When you're looking at fasteners, you have chrome fasteners. Those are a specialty type of fastener. You have what we call grade eight bolts. And these are a special type of fastener that take the most amount of torque. So when you're building an engine, the parts that are inside the engine that are rotating have to be held in place with a fastener strong enough to withstand the torque. So if you think you're building an engine and it's putting like 400 foot pounds of torque, so that means it's like 400 feet are pushing on this door to open it. If you kind of can think about torque like that, so they have to have these fasteners, and those are the great eight fasteners. Those things do not come in chrome. Chrome is a completely different process when it comes to fasteners. So usually you see zinc-plated fasteners, and that's basically just an anti-corrosion thing. But having all this chrome on something that would be just a utility vehicle, that would be a lot of money right there, just in chrome on this vehicle. Now, this one probably is a little bit different than what you would consider a normal day fastener, and that's Daniel J. Anderson's oil can triptych. I love this one because it's almost an ode to the old automotive industry. And what is so fun about this one is that if you've ever been in an auto parts store and you went to buy oil, they come in these plastic containers and they're kind of square with a little spout on it. Before that, oil used to come actually in glass jars with a spout that you poured out. So you can pick up a six pack of oil in glass jars, not to be confused with your milk. That would be very important not to confuse your oil with your milk. You're like, oh, honey, no, that's oil. Please don't use that in your coffee. So they used to come that way. And then the industry changed and they had to put the oil in these round cardboard containers with metal tops. So if you can think of like a can of beans or a can of green beans or a can of vegetables, they look like that except wider. So they're probably about three to four inches across and about five, six inches tall. And they have this metal top to them. Some of them are made out of metal, but most of them later on they came out of cardboard. And so they would have to use a tool where you would do, maybe anybody that's seen this, that you would take a tool and you would cut into the top of it by a lever and it would make this triangle shape to allow you to pour the oil out. Well, if you're trying to pour in a can of oil into an opening that's like two inches around, you wanna get oil all over the place. So what the automotive industry came up with is a special spout that at the very tip of it had that little triangular opening that you can open up the can of oil, push it down in, and then it had a spout that allowed you, this metal spout that allowed you to pour it into the valve cover or into the oil receptacle so you wouldn't get oil all over the engine. People still get oil all over the engine, no matter what kind of receptacle they use. So this is what was really fun about these type of teapots is he's taking the idea of the old oil can and instead of putting the spout at the top of it, he puts it down at the side at the bottom, then he adds a handle. Now, then he adds this really long stack and you're like, how does that relate to anything? Well, we used to use oil cans to oil all these different points on vehicles. That's when vehicles were actually made out of metal. So you had door points and you had um, suspension points and you had hood points and you had trunk points. So instead of those hydraulic shocks that we use now when you open up the hood, it was actually a metallic spring that you used. So all those points would squeak. <laughs> That's annoying. So we had these oil cans and at the top of them would be little plungers 
if you needed to put pressure on them. And so that's what these, at the top of these oil cans, sort of remind me of, of these old time oil cans that you go and you would squirt oil out and it would lubricate all these points. So he's using these ideas. And then just to make it even more fun, if we start in the far left, that was one of the original logos for the Shell Oil Company. So it was based upon uh, the muscles from back east when it first started. And then Shell was one of the few companies that actually hired illustrators instead of just like in-house designers to make their logo. So they came up with the Shell Oil Company to the logo we're familiar with now, the yellow shell with the red. And they, were, they said that they also picked those colors because that was mo very common in, um, in marine applications. So that's why they picked the yellow and the red. And then the middle one, I actually had to do some digging. I was like, mobile oil, but wait, the Pegasus, the winged horse is facing the wrong way. It goes the other way. And who is so coney? What is that? So I had to do a little digging on this history, which is really exciting for me, because obviously I love history. And now this is automotive history, that it was actually Standard Oil Company of New York that owned by the Rockefellers. And so they got hit by the monopoly from Congress and he had to break up the company. So the company got broken up into all these different names. Mobile was one of them. Um, Stoney was another one. Then eventually they were merged again, which made no sense. I'm like, so you broke them up and then later on then they merged again and became one. I was like, isn't that kind of opposite of monopoly? But there we go. So that was its logo. And then the mobile oil that we see now, which is the blue letters with the red circle in the middle, that is what was mobile. And since they took over that, they just kept that Pegasus. So that was on mobile oil for a long time, except they turned it around. And then at the last one, there on our far right, the golf logo, very simple. It was oil found in the Gulf Coast, specifically Texas. So they were very creative down there and they came up with an orange logo that said golf. And that is the most that they did with their logo. So I was like, okay, that's really cool. I enjoyed that. That's cool. So for me, this is really fascinating because I'm seeing several different things all together. So, you know, we have reminiscence here of the threads and of fasteners on two of the cans. And then the other cans are just reminding me of different components or tools that I have used because my father was in the automotive field for so long that I was able to see some of these older type of tools that you would have used at the time. Just because he had been in there for so long, a lot of times we inherit tools from other technicians. Like I have tools that I inherited from my father. He's like, oh, okay, you're a technician. Here's some tools. I was like, yay, awesome. And then another friend goes, yeah, my grandfather was a body mechanic. Here, here's some of his tools. I'm like, yay, I have no clue what this is. Let me go ask somebody much older than me. <laughs> so that has been really fun. Alrighty, so now that we've explored fasteners and my view of them, I would love to hear it, what any questions anyone would have about anything that we have reviewed or any comments. So everyone feel free to either put um, your questions in the chat or turn on your camera and ask them or just unmute yourself and ask them. Um, I'm going to just have a comment first. I have never looked at these ceramic pieces in this way, DM, and it's been a really fun adventure to just think about these pieces in a different way because what I, my first impression is, is not yours. And I really appreciate looking at these works differently today. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Hey, DM, I have a quick question. I'm really curious how you think, um, your experience as a mechanic and a technician and uh, expert in all things mechanical has translated to your new career as an art historian and how you've used some of those skills in this new field, which is, you know, very different, but might have some parallels. I think one of the biggest parallels between being a technician, 
not a mechanic, but a technician versus art history is research. So if I have a customer come in and they say, my, my vehicle's making a funny noise. Well, as a service advisor, I need to narrow that down. So does it do it in the morning? Does it do it in the evening? Is it, does it do it when you're going over bumps? Does it only do it when you're turning? So I have to pull all this information on the customer. Then as a technician, I have to go through and search through technical service bulletins or TSBs to try to find out, is this something that is nationally? Is this something the manufacturer is aware of? Okay, nobody's aware of this. Okay, cool. So then I go through and I test drive it. So I'm doing research on the vehicle myself to figure out where is this coming from? You open the glove box going, yeah, Colt 45, that's probably your noise. Or you know what? The ashtray is not designed to carry five pounds of change. That's part of the reason why you're having this noise. Or my favorite one, noise in a door panel that you only heard if you went over a speed bump very fast. Come to find out when I pull the door panel off, there's nothing in there. Pull it off three times. And I'm like, I know the noise is here. Put chassis ears on it. So listening devices on the vehicle, drove the vehicle. That's exactly where the noise is. So luckily, I'm small. I put my head in the door panel. The door panel is about this big. So I put my head in the door panel with the light down in there. And you know what I found? I found this little six inch extension that's probably about a quarter inch thick that it was all black. It had fallen in where the door panel on the outside meets the inside and it makes this little crevice. And that's where water drains out. It had fallen in there when they were building the vehicle. So unless you went over a speed bump really hard, then this extension would jump up and rattle. That's how I found it. So all this research you go into, so when I go into art history, it's the same thing. You're like, here's your piece, what can you tell me about it? It's all about going through and researching it. And it's like, so what do I know about this piece? What do I know about this problem? So where does all the literature on it? Where's the literature on this problem? Okay, then I physically go and spend time with the piece and say, okay, this is what, I found on this piece, the same thing with the problem. So I think those two are a really strong parallel. Thanks, Sam. Um, we have a request if we can show the picture of the artwork before the teapot again. Sure. All right, let's screen share. Um, I'm thinking this one. And we'll pull this forward. And the artwork's there. Is, is that what you're seeing? Is that what, not what you're seeing? Um, we're not seeing anything. We're just still seeing you. It, I think. Okay, hold on a second. I think you have to re screen share. Uh, sorry, I lost myself. Nope. Okay, now how do I get out of this? How? Ends and slideshow. Okay, there we go. All right. So let's see. Screen share this. Let's do it this way. Share that one. And this one is here. And that one. Is that the one that we were talking about? Can, can we see the septic? Can we see anything? Yeah, we can see the septic piece, DM. I don't have a comment that it's the wrong one, so. Okay, cool. And we wanted to see this piece we had a question about. At this point, it was just a request to see it again. Oh, okay, not a problem. Not a problem. That was a, a really fun piece. I had to take a lot of pictures around different areas because I thought it was just so cute. We have this huge truck and a little tiny ceramic. It's so cute. Anyone else have any other questions? Oh, come on. I'm a teacher. I love answering questions. Any questions? Um, so the comment was, is a cool steampunk art, especially the teapot. <laughs> yes, I see the high pressure teapot is kind of like that steampunk idea. <laughs> I have a lot of fun looking at steampunk because they just take a lot of mechanical parts and put them on top of each other, totally unrelated to anything and incapable of doing anything, but they just look cool. So they just put a bunch of gears 
on top of each other, like steampunk. I'm like, yes, but if you know anything about steam, they actually didn't use gears. <laughs> they actually use boiler pumps and double acting cylinders. So for steam, there's no gears really in it. So I always thought that was interesting. Anyone else have a question? KDM, it's Matt. <laughs> I absolutely love your formal analysis. It's just like unparalleled <laughs> um, and so signature to you. But um, I just wanted to know, I've never seen, I'm not familiar with any one of these artists. Um, I haven't seen these pieces in the collection. So thank you for bringing uh, the permanent collection um, to the surface and showing us some gems. Uh, I wanted to know why you chose the works that you chose how did you search for them in the collection? Were you looking for specific motifs or, or keywords? Um, and I noticed that the works that you chose are primarily coming from the ceramics collection. Um, and if there was any 2D or sculptures that are outside of ceramics that you found. Um, and yes, that was my question. <laughs> Honestly, to do 2D work would take a lot of time to do. So 3D, we have more of a limitation on what we have. So that was easier to search through. And I will say this, searching through our collection for anything that has fasteners or mechanical or mechanized took forever. That took weeks. That was a lot of researching, just trying to figure out different names to come up with things. It was like, what would I call this? And sometimes going, oh, that looks good. I'm like, no, that's a, that's a brick wall. That's not it. And constantly searching for this. The reason why I chose these pieces, because they do have some type of mechanical element to it, some type of um, part that is somehow related to the idea of machinery. Because of my status in the automotive field, I can pretty much fix just about anything that's motorized whether it's an electric engine or a combustion engine. Um, I actually have an associate's degree in automotive and diesel. So this is an occupational degree. That means I'm also trained on 18 wheelers. So I can do anything from fix the trailer to fix the truck. And I actually had to do that for a friend one time. <laughs> so I have all of this experience to just fix just about anything. Like for example, my chair fixes airplanes on the side because it's his fun, it's his hobby. Cars is his job, airplanes is his hobby. And I had to ask him something about an engine airplane. And because it's the same language, it's really easy for me to understand because it's all the same thing. So what drew me to these components is one, are they automotive related? And two, are they related in any way to something mechanical? Because for me, this mechanical understanding is all based upon what my educational background is in automotive. It's not nowadays where people think, oh, you learn automotive by becoming an apprentice to somebody. No, that's after you've gone to school and you've gone through all this. I can sit and have a conversation with your house electrician because I'm well-founded in Ohm's Law, which is the basis of electricity. I have to be. I have to know hydraulic systems. I have to know combustion. I have to know things like torque, and I have to know all these different things in order to properly repair a vehicle, especially at my level. And I joke a lot with people, especially in academia, it's like, yes, you have a PhD, but in my field, I'm the doctorate. <laughs> Thanks, Tiam. Um, Mary Beth was saying that a lot of these are out in open storage, which is great. <laughs> oh, yes. um, I have another question, um, if no one else has one, but I, um, since a lot of these are ceramics, um, which are often placed um, in this broader category of craft, which is a contested category, it made me associate the work that you do as a mechanic as a form of craft. Um, and how I just wanted to, you know, provoke that question to you. Um, what, it, how do you feel about the work that you do as a mechanic as a form of craft? I think that one is probably answered when you get into custom cars. People would see custom cars like Liz's show that's currently on, which is more of a concept car than a customized car, that when you reach a certain level, 
you are no longer, you're not at a level, so to speak, that I can go out and just build a car. And that's moving you past that. So that goes back to what is art type of question, because it is a type of craft. Do you know how to handle these tools and handle these tools correctly and handle them at a professional level? So somebody just learning to weld is not the same as my friend that's a certified aerospace welder. So there's, there's all these different levels. So is it a type of craft? Absolutely, I, I think so. And I think that is really well illustrated when you go to car shows and you're looking at a lot of these vehicles that have been customized where they've cut the tops off. You got little tiny windows or they've taken this little tiny car and they put this huge engine in it, you know. So I think that, yes, it is a type of craft at that level. When you, we work every day, I don't really see that as a craft. That's just repair. Thank you, Matt. And I know Michael has a, a question because he keeps jumping on. <laughs> Hi there, DM. Thank you for this presentation. I know so little about mechanics and learned quite a bit from you. I was curious to know if you came across anything in our collection that's aviation related? Honestly, I did not really see anything aviation because I would have snagged it if I did, but it doesn't mean we don't have something in there, at least not in 3D work, and that's where my concentration was. Maybe there might be something in 2D, but for 3D, I really didn't see it. But then again, there were a, a piece that I wanted to see that we had a hard time tracking down, and then we finally found it in one of the buildings. And that was a really interesting adventure where you went up to go down and then down to go over. I was just really interesting to find it like, oh, there's that piece. I didn't even know where it was at. So it's possible we might in 3D, but in, in 2D, I'm not really sure because I didn't put my concentration in there. But if we did, I would, but I will tell you this, in my master thesis on women in machinery, I have three paintings three murals, huge murals, like airplane hangar, huge, that are that deal with aircraft. Well, I would love to read that. Awesome, then I'll make sure to invite you when I defend my thesis so you can see them. Thank you, I appreciate that. And it, second, second to that question is, in your experience with maintenance mechanic, being a technician, is there any crossover in the field between avionics and aviation, aviation technicians and technicians on vehicles, cars specifically? So if you're working in airlines and you would still be called a technician because it's still the same thing, it's still repairing. And the reason why I can understand aviation is because it's all the same general principles. They use a combustion engine. So a combustion engine, whether I'm dealing with two stroke or four stroke, I had to understand two stroke because diesels are two stroke, which is the same thing as small engines, which like your lawnmower, it's two stroke or motorcycles are two stroke. I can fix a motorcycle. I could probably build one. I don't know how to ride a motorcycle. Does that make sense? Sure. And then when you're dealing with aviation, they do a lot of hydraulics. And so a really strong part of my degree was hydraulics. Not only did I need to understand hydraulics in the steering and also in brakes for automotive, I had to understand hydraulics in diesel trucks. So we under, had to understand it in that too. So I actually had to literally take cylinders, pull the ram out, pull the piston apart, pull it all the way down, and then put it all back together and then have it checked by the instructor. So I had a very strong background in hydraulics. So airplanes work some of the same ways. And electrical is electrical is electrical. Whether I'm dealing with a 12 volt system on a car, a 24 volt system, on a diesel or um, 110 or 220 in a house, it's all the same thing, except I know what will kill you. Believe it or not, you can die faster by touching the wrong part of an electric vehicle than you can if you touch a house electrical outlet, believe it or not, because of the amount of voltage in it. So it just, they overlap in many ways, but the very specifics, like working on an Asian car electrical system has a very specific way that it's set up where they use gr um, ground to turn things on, where domestic cars use power to turn things on. So they're just two different ways of using electrical systems. But they're still the same thing because I can work on both. Same thing with aviation. Is well, that now, yeah, that's great. And now I even am more excited to come sit in on your defense because I love your passion about this and, and it's amazing. 
and it's great and it's cool to see you connected to art history now. It's awesome. So thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. All right, so I'm going to do one last call for questions. Um, but just DM, thank you very much. For those of you who joined late, I just want to say, so we've done a little few changes for 2021. So we split up our conversations. Um, so we have on the first Thursday of the month and the third Tuesday of the month. So our next program will be January 19th. We have a guest speaker. Her name is Gabriela Munez. Um, she uh, works at um, Haida and she was part of the mapping program where we're, we're exhibiting one of the prints from the mapping portfolio. I'm not going to explain it because I'm going to save that for her. And I encourage you and hope that you, we can see you all on January 19th. But I think um, since I don't see any questions pop up besides another thank you, which DM, thank you so much. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys soon. And um, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. Shout out, visit the CRC, it's still open. It is. <laughs> Bye everyone. Bye, thank you.